So the first speech of the day comes from uh, Mike. So I'd like to welcome Mike to the stage, and um, he's going to talk about a career in resource estimation and 30 years of uh, 30 years of hurt. What was it the chap said? Whatever you do, don't press the black button. <laughs> uh, yeah, morning, everybody. It's great to see so many people here. Um, even though this says a career in resource estimation starts in, in my career in 1988, actually I started work on the gold mines in South Africa in 1983. Uh, but those of you who, who were around at that time will know that uh, resource estimates for those mines were not produced by geologists in those days, but they were actually produced by surveyors. Um, and Danny Kariga himself was, was a surveyor, not a, not a geologist. Um, so, but when I first sort of got into resource estimates was uh, when I started my PhD. Uh, and the first one I produced was in 1988, um, although, to be honest, they didn't actually use the estimate I produced. I think they preferred their hard copy plans and sections. So. Anyway, uh, oh, just one quick anecdote about Danny Krieger, who was a really nice guy. And um, he, towards the end of his career, he worked as an associate of quite a few consultancies, including ours. And I, I remember once I was putting a proposal together, and the client asked for some CVs. Um, and I got CVs from one of our mining engineers, who will remain nameless, and he had a CV that was 20 pages long and listed all of the jobs that he'd, he'd done. And then I got Danny Krieger's CV, CV through, and it, it just said, invented a system of grade interpolation called Krieging. We'll stop. <laughs> That's what I said. Okay, so if we transport ourselves back to 1988, um, keeping up the football tip theme, that's the England squad that... Um, got knocked out at the group stage of the Euros in 1988. No change there. At the bottom, we've got uh, Margaret Thatcher, who had that year became the longest serving prime minister in the, in the UK this, that century. Uh, the one pound note went out of uh, circulation and replaced itself with a coin. And then the picture in the top right, uh, that's actually not really focused on Ronald Reagan. But if you look at the tourist that's standing behind that boy who's shaking his hand, that's actually Vladimir Putin. Um, in the days before he became um, the, the Premier of Russia and was actually working for the KJ, KGB. Okay, so um, following on a bit from, from Lucy's sort of general principles, I've, I've split the, the discussion up into sort of quality of data, geological modelling, and uh, resource reporting. Um, and if we say 1988, if we look back to what was going on in 1988, um, I mean, in fairness, there was a lot of data collected in those days. It was very neatly produced. Geological descriptions were incredibly detailed. There was a lot of check assay work going on. There was really nothing a great deal wrong with the quality of the data that was being produced at the time. Geological modeling, and there's a little picture there. I don't know if you can see it very well, but those of you who went round mines in the 80s and 90s will be familiar with the old balsa wood plan that they used to have in the, in the foyers. Um, every month they would get updated, bits of balsa wood stuck on all the development ends to replicate you know, what was happening with the, the three-dimension um, modelling of the, of the ore body. But in terms of actually producing resource estimates in those days, most of us were, we were just producing um, you know, geological sections and geological plans. Um, and they formed the basis of almost all the resource estimates that were produced. And certainly um, existing mines were almost all paper-based. You know, at the time, computers were just being introduced, um, and, but if you went to a mine, it would almost certainly be, be all hard copy. And it was really only the new exploration projects and the new mines that were starting to use, uh, use computers. But it was, it was a bit different to now. It wasn't the case that we had several computer packages produced by different companies that were sort of commercially available. Rather, mines were developing their own systems. So you go to a mine, I remember Tara Mine had their own system. It's quite an elaborate system. Uh, Rio Tinto had their own software that they were using in-house. Anglo had its own software it was using in-house. And in SRK, we started to develop our software in-house as well. And that subsequently became uh, Gemcom, which was um, subsequently now is a part of Serpa. So but that was actually developed within SRK because there were no systems out there commercially available uh, for us to buy. But those, those packages that were around were, were very slow and clunky. Uh, compared to the ones that, that we have now. And so you would typically have relatively few blocks and try and limit your data sets. Uh, 
And I used to, when I was doing an estimate, when I first joined SRK, which was in 1990, um, the first estimates I was producing, we had one 386 computer in the office. And the only time I could use it was when, at the end of the day, when the secretary had gone home. So I used to set the estimate going in the evening. And you could watch the screen as it told you which block was being produced. So block one of 60, block two of 60, block three of 60. And you could watch it actually being, being done. And then you'd go home and come in in the morning, and it had either worked all the way through or it had clunked out at block 32 or something, and you'd have to start the whole process again. Um, but, you know, so you, the, the statistics that people were doing then, the, the methodology, the interpolation, was typically relatively simple, compared, certainly compared to the sort of the, 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 the um, methods that people use today. And it, it took the reporting codes, well, they were equally, uh, equally sort of new on the block at that time. The, the JORT code hadn't been produced. The JORT, first JORT code was 1989. IMM produced the code in 1991. There were, there were existing codes, but they were, they were, they were quite different. Um, they're different terms, and then when they have the same terms, they often had different meanings. So it was very important that when you reported something, you said which... which um, which code you were using, because if you use one code, probable would mean something different to what it meant in, in another code. That said, that wasn't the case. Um, and we actually did a, a survey in, uh, uh, in 1993, a survey, 15 annual reports. Um, <laughs> but, um, and we just looked through each of those annual reports and just looked at how they reported their resource and reserve estimates. Um, and you know, as you can see from this slide here, you know, only two, only two of them actually um, uh, stated the code they were using and, and what the terms meant. The rest of them presented resource and reserve estimates, but didn't say what code they were. So reporting codes existed at the time, but they were rarely being used. And when they were being used, they weren't really being explained properly. So if we then <coughs> fast forward 30 years, things have changed slightly. We nearly won the World Cup uh, this year. Um, the, uh, it's been announced that the £20 note is, is going to go plastic uh, in line with some of the other notes. Um, obviously, I've not changed very much. Uh, and um, Vladimir Putin is now in his, his fourth term of office. And I guess in terms of quantity and quality of, of data, um, there have been significant changes, and, and really they stem from, from BRIEX. Uh, which I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with, and which is also, you know, what we have to blame um, 43101 on, uh, because that certainly stems from, uh, from BRIEX. And while I don't, I'm not necessarily sure that the, the quality of data is hugely better now, there's certainly a lot more repeat assaying, a lot more check assaying, a lot more uh, independent review than there was at the time, and a lot more focus on, on the data than there ever was uh, before. One of my personal bugbears, though, is often when you, when you read reports and there's a huge amount of detail on the assays and the check assays and the independent assays, it's, it's still quite rare when you get issues that something is done about it. It's quite often just presented as, as that we've, we've done all this. But, you know, the key thing for me is, well, if you find an issue or a discrepancy, how do you, how do you then, what did you do? You know, what did you do when you found it? And um, so even though we do have a lot more detail and a lot more checks, sometimes the actual following through uh, from that is, is, is not so detailed. I mean, geological modelling has obviously changed out of all uh, recognition from the modelling that, that I was doing. So three-dimensional modelling now is typical, and I know our guys in the office, they actually in interpolate in 3D on, on the screen and model in 3D. Whereas if I look back to the estimates I produced, so we, we kind of produced 3D estimates because you had to inform a block model of what the... The, what the geology was. But the way that was done at, at the time, um, going back to 1988, is that you would create your geological sections, interpolate on your geological section. And the way most software packages then worked is that you cut plans through your sections at every elevation in, in the block model. And your blocks would typically be your, your, your bench height. So you would have a plan going through at every bench level. And you'd interpolate your sections, and then the software would produce these plans, and it would put little ticks on the section marks to show you what geology you'd interpolated. And then you would, you would interpolate your geology on those plans. So if you had 40 levels, you had to do 40 plan interpolations in, in, on those plans. And then you had to check that they matched your sections. And it was a case of going backwards and forwards between the plans and the sections to create all those layers of geology. And then that is what informed the block model you know, of the rock type. So 
if you can imagine you were doing that at the time, the tendency was to use fairly large blocks, because otherwise you were there an awful, lo an awful long time. But now, of course, and I know there's, there's some talks today on, on geological modeling, and it's, it's changed significantly, and I think there's a huge advances in, in the modeling software. And as I say, now, typically, there's a lot of packages out there that people use to do, to do their interpolations, and the interpolations have got increasingly, increasingly complex. So if in 1988, you know, typically, you would do something very simple inverse distance or, or something like that, whereas now it's multiple indicator Krieging and all sorts of different types of Krieging. It's much more complex because the computers can, can do that. Um, and then, you know, going back again to 90, well, if I'm going back to, to 1988, when I was producing my first estimate, I actually produced a, a 2D estimate, and I used uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3. And I wrote the uh, Krieging algorithms into the Excel uh, software and then interpolated using the spreadsheet as a um, as a plan. Um, so again, you can imagine it's a relatively simple sort of interpolation method, but there were very few. But PC Mine, which is the first Gemcom <coughs> package, wasn't, didn't exist at the time. Um, and I think Isabel Clark's Geostockers had just about come out about, about that time, but there were very few commercially available packages. So yeah, Lotus 123 was, uh, was my first estimate. And of course, the other, the other big change is, is, is the reporting codes. And you know, largely thanks to Jork initially, and then subsequently with, with Crisco, the codes have gradually become much more standardized. So even though we have many international codes, and most countries like to have their own codes, which are typically linked to, the, to their stock exchanges and their reporting, broadly speaking, certainly most of the international codes are now pretty well aligned and follow the Crisco template. Um, so it means you, at least you can now read codes and have a, a general feeling of the relativity. Um, and Russia developed its own Crisco code um, about seven or eight years ago. And Kazakhstan produced its first uh, Crisco compliant code this year. Um, and that code has now been written into the new mining code in Kazakhstan. So as of today, if you have a new project in Kazakhstan, you have to use the, the Crisco code. So they've, they've sort of joined the party. If you've got an existing mine, then yet I think you have until 2024, I think, to change. But essentially, they've, they've written the new, the new code into their, into their law. And there also moves afoot in India and China to similarly start to move towards the same reporting code. So there's certainly been significant changes in reporting that have standardized the way we report. And as well as standardizing it, I think a couple of really good points have come out of that, that process. There are guidelines have been developed for reporting expiration results that didn't exist before to ensure that the way people report expiration results is consistent from project to project. And also the, the change to limit your resource to what is, uh, has potential to be mined. Certainly if you went back 30 years and someone told you what a resource was, there would be no suggestion that that needed to be economic. It, it was just material in the ground, uh, whereas a reserve was economic. And so consequently, people reported resources that had no chance of ever coming to book or being mined. But with the codes being introduced and standardized, it's, it's become now part of all of those codes that resource estimates, when they're reported, they must have potential to be mined. And in the JORC code, it says more likely than not that those resources will, will be mined. I have to say, with all the resource estimates I, I review, that's obviously not always the case. But that certainly is the, um, is the theory. And the other bit of the reporting that's become much more um, uh, regulated is the conversion of resources to reserves which arguably in the early codes could just be a bit of economics on the back of a fag packet. You know, nowadays there's, it's written into the codes the level of engineering that needs to be done to enable you to report a reserve rather than a, rather than a resource. So all, all good changes to, uh, to my mind. So we did another survey in 2013, um, and this time uh, with the aid of uh, computers and a VAC student, we, we looked at 145 uh, uh, companies. And, and it, was all, it was the other way around. All of these, apart from two, uh, stated the, the code they were using. Um, and I'm, no great surprise, but the most common code that was being used was the, uh, was the JORC code. So a huge difference in take-up of the code and systematic reporting. So just to perhaps summarize some of the, the key changes then uh, in, the, in the 30 years, definitely increased concern about the integrity of data and therefore increasing amounts of due diligence and review of, of data that's been used for projects. 
the availability of a more, much more powerful and smaller, it has to be said, uh, um, computers, um, which has enabled us to produce much more complex geological models and use much more complex algorithms. And the standardizing of reporting uh, resources and reserves um, across, across most of the, um, the international mining world. But, you know, it's not all positive, I don't think. Um, you know, while, while there, as I think I said at the beginning, while there was certainly less focus, uh, less review focus on the quality of data in 1988, most projects did focus a lot on it. They had more time, they collected data. Um, geological logs that were produced in the 80s and 90s tend to be much more detailed than geological logs produced now, which are sometimes coded immediately rather than allowing the descriptive geology to still be there. Um, and while, well, you know, um, it's true that the geological models we produced in 1988 might have been more simple and were plan and section based, you had a lot more time. Um, and so a lot more time was, was you had to develop those models. At the moment, you know, if someone approached SRK and asked for a resource estimate and maybe you asked for when the client wanted it, um, you know, he'd probably expect you to do it within two, three, four weeks. Whereas in 1988, we were probably producing one every three or four months which gave you a lot more time to look at the data and be a lot less time pressure. I think there's much more time pressure now, which means that even though we've got better tools, it doesn't always mean we can make full, full use of them. So 3D modeling has definitely, has definitely made it easier for us and, um, uh, to move. I've got this awkward thing when I, my, if I put my glasses on. I can see you, but I can't see this. And if I take my glasses off, I can see that I can't see you. I'm just trying to work out which one's best. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, I think one, even though you know geological models are more detailed now, you know there, there is still a tendency with some models that tend to look a bit like Klingon warships, and they're a bit sort of angular and and and, and what have you. So, you know, certainly we've got the tools, but the results are not always um, not always so good. Um, and even though there are more complex algorithms and better geostats being used now, certainly on operating mines where you've got the, uh, the existing data. I'm not convinced that there's as much or any more, shall we say, understanding of the geostats behind those than there was 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, where you almost had to understand because you, almost, you, you might have even, even written the software yourself, um, whereas now we're just focused more on, on using that software. And a couple of... Um, you know, one final uh, bugbear is on uh, reporting and classification because because one of the things that a lot of software now allows you to do is work out how far you, each block is from the nearest data point, uh, and that is often used as a mechanism for classification. So if you have, you can set up the computer so that if every block within so many meters of a, of a point you can class as measured and, and indicated and so on, and you can end up with some really strange things like these two examples. The, the one on the left hand side is, is a plan view, and the purple is measured and the yellow is indicated and the red is inferred, and I think you can all guess where the drill holes were. But, you know, given, if, if that's a consistent geological deposit, to my mind, you know, that should all be one classification. It shouldn't be split up into three classifications. It's all equally well known. To put little dots around holes is, is just inappropriate. And similarly, the other example shows the same thing, down hole, where someone has classified measured following the holes down, the blocks nearer to a hole, and then got indicated and inferred. As to my mind, you should be looking at the geology, looking at the confidence in it, and saying, okay, this area is measured, this area is indicated, this is inferred, not, not doing it in a mathematical, statistical way, just because the software enables you to do so. And it's simple. So, finally, uh, last slide. Yeah, yeah, there have been si some significant changes in resource estimation and reporting in the, in the time that I've been uh, doing it. Um, and I think we're certainly in a better position now to produce better estimates and better models. We've got much better tools, but the time pressures are, are much more. Um, and I suspect there are probably just as many poor and bad estimates now as there were in 1988. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. That was excellent. Good start to the day. Um, and we're a bit ahead of schedule, so that's good. Let's crack on. Um, so